thank you so much for everyone uh, for being here today. We're thrilled to host another webinar series on logistics and motion. And uh, we uh, are very grateful to have the collaboration of the Trade Commissioner Services in Brazil from the Canadian government. And um, I'm thrilled to share this um, presentation with you. And I want to welcome my um, speaker uh, for today, Nadine Lopez, uh, from the Trade Commissioner Office in Rio. So welcome, Nadine. It's great to have you here. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation today. Uh, a little bit about Mellowhawk uh, before. Thank you, <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, a little bit about Mellowhawk. We're in business for 17 years. There's some numbers of our company, and I'm just going to briefly discuss some of the services that we do for those who uh, for those who don't know who we are. So we are a full uh, service uh, logistics uh, provider. So we move cargo by air, ocean, and trucking. We do customs clearances, uh, distribution across Canada and all over the world with our network of agents, and. Uh, uh, we're very active in Brazil, of course. I am Brazilian, um, and I have been in Canada for 30 years. Uh, so we, Brazil and South America are a niche market for us because we understand the complexities of customs and supply chain uh, in that region more than any other place in the world. It's, it's a focus of ours, of course, but we do cover the world. Um, warehouse and distribution is something that we do here in Canada and in Brazil as well. Uh, all the permits and licenses that you have to have to move cargo, hazardous material or radioactive material as well, we do have it. And we are an approved supplier from the Canadian and Brazilian government. So we're very grateful. It took a very long time to, to get that approval. So um, we hold that very dear uh, to our hearts. Um, and we do a lot of consulting and planning. So either Brazilian companies that want to penetrate in Canada or Canadian companies that want to penetrate in Brazil, we do offer consulting where we would discuss uh, inco terms and uh, whatever is necessary for that product to enter Brazil together with the trade commissioner office as well. There's a lot of exchange of information that we do between us in order to come up with the right solution for you. Uh, Brazil is a huge market, as you can imagine, uh, continue to grow, uh, but customs is very delicate. So my first advice to you, never ever ship anything to Brazil without the pre-approval of your customer, their customs broker, or every party involved in this transaction. You cannot just simply put something on a plane, on a boat, and ship it there, and then figure it out how it's going to enter Brazil, because that's not going to happen. So be very careful with it. And we're here to help you. Um, I want to talk a little bit, as I always do, our latest news, what's happening in the world in terms of supply chain or things that we see this week to bring you up to date because of COVID-19. As you know, the world has been disrupted in terms of supply chain. So these are the topics uh, today that I felt it was important to share with you. Uh, so huge concern of investors in US crude exports to Asia are uh, that are stored on board of large vessels that are anchored somewhere. So these barrels of oil are sitting, waiting for markets to, you know, get a better price, and then they can right away deliver. So, um, you know, people are kind of antsy about this because they're still waiting for this to develop while these barrels of oil are sitting somewhere uh, for a very long time. So it's a it's starting to be a, a huge concern right now for these investors. Uh, yesterday, more than 1,200 flights in and out of Beijing were canceled uh, due to a new outbreak of COVID where 130 people got infected. Uh, so this, as you can imagine, air freight has been disrupted worldwide. Uh, and China lately, if you need to ship something from China by air, which is a lot of PAP products are coming out of there. First of all, the price of air freight out of China went from a normal five to six dollars a kilo US to fifteen to twenty-five dollars a kilo US. And no product leaves China until it's prepaid to the airline. So there's no credit whatsoever. And as it is, products that have that must have eight to nine licenses in order to be exported from China due to the Chinese regulations at the very last minute are being 
uh, stopped on the runway and they are not loading them on the plane. So it has been a really disaster since COVID started. And now when things are starting to get better with uh, um, prices coming down a little bit, uh, we see a reduction to $15 a kilo, things were getting better. And then now these 1,200 flights were canceled yesterday due, due to this outbreak, which is again, it's going to be a huge issue uh, moving forward this week and next week. Um, it has been for a while now a shortage of drivers in North America. Trucking companies went bankrupt. There was lots of changes on regulations. And now with the COVID situation, we see an increase in this traffic now. And there is a burst of drivers coming up and com companies being really busy because they had to move, as you can imagine, products locally instead of waiting for foreign markets for these products to arrive in North America. So we see here an increase in truck movements and drivers as well. Uh, another buzz from supply chain dive is that the predictions is that uh, clients are asked to diversify their carrier portfolios. So before multinationals or companies would deal with only one steamship line or one airline or uh, whatever supplier. And now because of COVID, some people could not uh, fulfill uh, the transportation of goods. So the encouragement now is for clients to look to to diversify uh, their contacts and supply chain. So when there is a crunch, they have those relationships and they can move product. Okay. Uh, in Brazil, for the first time, there is a, a drilling and water depths below 500 meters using a drill ship in dynamic positioning without the use of anchoring. So this is a new system instead of having a, uh, a grounded platform uh, and it's a ship that moves around and it's able to drill, making it very flexible to drill in different parts instead of having the entire structure um, grounded to the ocean floor. So this is really uh, exciting news. By the way, you're gonna be getting a copy of this presentation, everyone that signed uh, up for this webinar so you can read it more in depth. And of course, Petrobras has started hitting about their potential sale of its entire stake in a set of seven onshore and shallow water concessions located in the state of Alagoas. So this is a huge thing. So we'll see if it happens with Petrobras in Brazil. I'm sure Nadine uh, knows more and, and later can share with us. So that's a little bit what's happening. There is still, as I said, a big disruption in supply chain in the world. Ocean freight is moving, has been moving, and it's a little bit of a delay. Air freight, it continues to be really critical right now where cargo planes are the ones that are mostly flying to some destinations where those routes were available. Some airlines like Air Canada to some destinations in South America changed the configuration of their passenger plane to hold cargo inside the plane and at the belly of the plane. So they're still taking cargo to some destinations, but it's still restricted. We hope that July will bring some good news uh, on some of these destinations and we can restore some of the damage on, on air freight worldwide. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about logistics, what you should uh, pay attention when you're dealing with large equipment or mining oil uh, equipments that are large size. Uh, the most cost efficient, uh, of course, modes of transportation for heavy and uh, expensive equipment are row row and low low, which is the type that large equipment are, are rolled into the ship or they drive themselves into self-propelled into into a ship. So when we're, we're talking about huge uh, machine parts or parts for turbines and uh, so forth. Also flat rack containers are used and also oil and gas industry needs repair on their equipment, which is time sensitive. And if you're dealing with Brazil on repairs and temporary importation, be very, very careful because if you import something into Brazil and it's clear, it's delivered, and then that part breaks, the process to take it out of Brazil back to North America or wherever it came from to be repaired, it's a customs process. And then when it goes back to Brazil, it's another customs process. And I have many examples of um, discussions with many clients that uh, product went for repair, it was shipped the wrong way back to Brazil and it got stuck for months and years at the port and it was not able to enter Brazil, causing huge lawsuits. So you have to be careful when you're dealing with repairs 
outside of Brazil and returning. So we can help you with that if you need to clarify this, these items. Another key components are insurance. Always have insurance, doesn't matter what you're doing with your equipment because you never know in the supply chain, if something happens, that's it. The first thing they're gonna ask you is, do you have insurance? Incoterms 2020, if you don't know what Incoterms are, is the transfer of risk and cost in the transaction between a shipper and a buyer, critical. It must be listed on your contract, on your invoice, on your sales order, whatever it is. Incoterms must be listed. Again, very tied up to insurance. If something happens, the first thing they're gonna look at is Incoterms. Ocean freight, of course, deal with somebody that has experience in ocean freight if you're dealing with large equipment. Documentation, as I mentioned about return and repairs, be careful with that. It's not the same when you, if it's coming for repair, it's not the same when it went in the first time. And uh, uh, local expertise at the port where the particular product is going. Brazil is very specific. Uh, certain products and licenses are allowed to enter Brazil through a specific port in order for concessions of taxes and uh, deals with the federal government or the provincial government. And if you're dealing with a large institution in Brazil, they will have their own specific procedures to enter Brazil. So very critical that you communicate with them, you ask those questions and we can guide you as well. So that's a little bit about my presentation and now I'd like to present to you the presenter for today, Nadine Lopez. So thank you so much for being here. The, for, you, for, for those of you who don't know the importance of the Trade Commissioner Office in Brazil and around the world, these are offices of the Canadian government who are based in Brazil. There are six offices of the Trade Commissioner and each of them have special officers that are related to specific industries and they know the market, they are in contact with potential buyers for you, they can speak to you about regulations and what you can do to prepare yourself to enter the market and they are an amazing resource for Canadian companies and that's why we started the series with them because we wanted to showcase how important the Trade Commissioner Office is to all of us here in Canada, and we must take advantage of them. So welcome, Nadine. Thank you so much for being here. And this is your next presentation. Is slide is yours. <laughs> thank you, Arnon. Uh, and thank you, uh, everybody at Mellow Hawk for putting this together and uh, providing us with this opportunity to talk to some Canadian clients about the uh, Brazilian market. Um, I'm not sure whether I should just pay, do some page down or can you do it for me for the first slide? Sorry. Okay, thank you all again. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, thank you. Um, I would like to give you some thoughts about the agenda today. What are we going to be talking about? So uh, at the beginning, I'm going to give you some context of the oil and gas industry in Brazil, uh, reflecting the two severe crises we are going through. We have our own uh, oil and gas price crisis that had begun before the COVID-19. And of course, we are right now in the middle of a major crisis because of the COVID. And the oil and gas industry has been severely affected because, uh, I mean, the demand for oil has dropped severely and that has impacted uh, the supply chain and, uh, and the producers and everybody else. We're also going to talk about, I'm going to give you uh, some brief uh, figures and facts about the oil and gas sector in Brazil so that you can have a better idea of, what, of how big and how important it is in the global scene. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you some, some information about recent regulation that has been put in place. There have been some important changes in Brazil recently and the regulation for oil and gas uh, was reviewed for the best. So now it's more pro-market, uh, if I can say that. Then I'm gonna, gonna talk a little bit about the main players in all the segments of the oil industry. 
Petrobras, the main player. Then I'm going to talk a little about a little bit more specifically about the opportunities that I see for Canadian suppliers and Canadian investors. And at the very end, some advice on doing business in Brazil, very briefly. Um, but the most important advice is think about identifying a partner. We're going to talk about this at the end of the presentation. So here we go. Let's talk about some oil and gas facts and figures. So uh, Brazil uh, holds the second largest oil reserves in South America, just after Venezuela. Right now, Brazil's production responds for about 3% of the global production of oil. Uh, Brazil is the seventh largest global oil producer. In terms of reserves, despite the fact that these are the official reserves, 16 billion of equivalent oil, in practice, what we have is a much bigger uh, uh, we have much bigger reserves in Brazil, and that's because of the pre-salt uh, play. The pre-salt is an offshore um, project. It, it's actually um, offshore reserves that, re that, um, that are located underneath the uh, salt layer. So we're talking about probably six, five, six uh, thousand meters underneath of water depth. So the pre-salt is today for sure one of the most important uh, oil and gas exploration production projects. And it is understood and believed that it holds around or approximately 90 billion um, of equivalent barrels of equivalent oil. Um, in terms of oil production, Brazil today produces in total uh, 2 million 117 um, thousand barrels per day and 85.4 million cubic meters of natural gas that's only from the pre-salt so um, just to give you an idea of how of how prolific and important and productive the pre-salt play is with only 114 wells, we can produce in Brazil 2.117 uh, uh, million barrels, nearly 2,200,000 2, uh, barrels a day, just from 114 wells. I don't think there's any other project in the world that's so productive, so prolific. So uh, that's one of the reasons why if you compare Brazil and other very important um, oil and gas uh, markets, we have been less impacted than other very important uh, um, places like, for example, the Gulf of Mexico, um, North of Africa, and other places, even Canada, talking about the oil sands. Well, 93% of our reserves in the country, they come from offshore fields. So when talking about the oil and gas sector in Brazil, you will think about the offshore industry, okay? That doesn't mean that we don't have an offshore uh, market. We do, but it's quite smaller than compared with uh, offshore. Total production in the country, um, nearly 3 million barrels a day and, and 124 million cubic meters of natural gas per day. Please, Arnon, can you go to the next one? Thank you. So about the regulation. Um, about 10 years ago, there was a big change in the, in the regulatory framework in Brazil when the pre-salt was discovered. The government decided to change the rules for the pre-salt play exclusively, and they introduced, after a few years, um, the so-called production sharing um, regime. So for the pre-salt exclusively, we have one regime, which is called, or is based on the production sharing uh, concept, and all the, other, uh, all the other assets that are offered in bidding rounds, they are, that is done under the old um, concession regime. Uh, because of the pre-salt um, 
because we had the, the discovery of the free salt and the regulation was changed, there was a gap in, uh, in the bidding rounds of five years and that dramatically impacted the exploration segment in Brazil. Luckily, after a few years more, we had a new uh, government in place and for the oil and gas segment, that, that was a very um, positive change. So they tried and they have been successful, I must say. They, they came up with new rules and they made some changes to try to make the, um, the regulatory environment in Brazil more market friendly, more pro-market. So today we have, as a consequence, as you can see on this slide, we have more flexible local content rules. So local content is still a requisite or a demand, something that has to be um, considered by oil companies investing in the country, but um, it's much less, much less uh, in terms of percentage, right? Um, right now there's a, there's a discussion going on about local content rules, I mean, the percentage for equipment, for services and onshore and offshore, the ANP, which is the natural, um, gas, natural gas and oil regulator, they have been talking and discussing a lot about that, but it's much more flexible. We have had since 2018 regular exploration bidding rounds taking place in the country and oil majors have been coming back, for instance, Exxon um, was the most, um, was the largest winning bidder in 19, and sorry, in 2019 with a number of exploration uh, fields. So all that to say, and many other companies as well, all that to say with the last three years, we have had regular exploration bidding rounds and a lot of the existing companies that were here, they acquired new exploration assets companies have come back and new players also uh, entered the market. So there's a lot of exploration work to be done in the coming decade, which means there's a lot of opportunities. There will be a lot of opportunities in all segments of the upstream uh, uh, market in Brazil. Something that's very interesting, especially for investors, for oil companies interested in entering the Brazilian market, is a permanent offer. That is a new um, kind of regime that was um, implemented by the ANP, the regulator in Brazil. So basically, what does that mean? Some very um, uh, specific assets are put on, on bid on a permanent basis. So any oil company interested in uh, acquiring assets in Brazil, they don't have, they no longer have to wait for a bidding round to be organized by the ANP to buy assets. Those assets that are offered through the permanent offer are normally not the most important ones, I mean, not the most expensive ones. This is more for medium sized or a junior companies. So they are offering through the permanent offer. Uh, onshore mature fields, shallow water mature fields, some exploration assets as well. Uh, so this is, for, this is another way for companies to enter the market without having to wait for a bidding round, which, is normally, which normally takes place once a year. And also there's something going on about the natural gas market, which is um, effectively opening to uh, private investment with the withdrawal of Petrobras. This is something I'm going to, um, to address in the next slide. So please, Arnon, if you can go on. Thank you. So when we think about the oil and gas sector, who are the main players? Just so you know, the most important players, those who know a little bit about Brazil, is definitely Petrobras, our state-run uh, oil giant company. Petrobras holds approximately today, I would say about 80% of the uh, production market. So all about 80% of all the oil and gas that's produced in the country is Petrobras. 
but we also have very important oil uh, majors exploring and producing oil in the country. We have Shell, we have British Petroleum, we have Total, we have Equinor, Repsol, Exxon, who came back, as I mentioned, in the last bidding rounds, uh, investing a lot in exploration assets offshore. We have also um, some local companies that I would think uh, that I would say is, is valid mentioning here, companies like Petro Rio, Enalta, Eneva, Petro Reconcavo, Imetami, the last ones are all onshore players. In the uh, gas transportation um, segment, we have two important companies and both have a very strong Canadian content, if I can say that. TAG is a, uh, belongs to French uh, NG, but there they, have, they do have a strong Canadian content, which is from a Quebec pension fund. Uh, and NTS is a, so both our TAG and NTS are both uh, natural gas pipelines. They are the two largest natural gas pipelines uh, in the country, and they are both now operated by private investors. As said, TAG is owned by French Engie, but they do have uh, a partnership with a, a Canadian um, entity, which is a um, the Canadian Pension Fund, and NTS is owned by Canadian Brookfield. Brookfield owns a 90% stake in NTS. These are the most important uh, natural gas pipelines in the country. They are huge. And why am I saying that? Because now that they are private assets, it is quite easier, I would say much easier, for any international supplier to do business with these companies to offer services, equipment for maintenance, for instance, than it was when they were in the hands of a state-run company. In terms of gas distribution, um, we have local distribution companies across the country. Most, almost all of the, uh, not all of them, but most of the uh, Brazilian states uh, have their own gas distribution um, companies. Most of them still have some partnership with Petrobras, but they are mostly owned by the local governments. There is one or another that are private companies, but roughly speaking, it's a combination of a partnership between Petrobras and the local government. In terms of the downstream segment, Petrobras holds a huge monopoly. It's a total monopoly of the refining market. But they are right now in the process of selling about 50% of their refineries in the country as part of their divestment plan and as part of a new policy in the company to become more competitive and to open the market. So this can be a good opportunity for investors. I'm going to talk about that in the next slides as well. In terms of distribution, fuel distribution, the most important players are still Petrobras, even though they have uh, very recently sold a good part of their uh, shares to the private sector, so they are no longer the only, uh, I mean, they don't, they don't own the VR distribution company 100% as they used to. They are still very important, but there's, I mean, the market is much more divided right now after they sold these assets. Shell is an important player in the uh, fuel distribution, and Ipiranga is a local company. They also have a good market share in terms of fuel distribution. Arnon, if you can move on. Thank you. Well, I have to give you some information on our most important player. I must say, when you talk about doing business in the oil and gas sector in Brazil, Petrobras is certainly going to be your main focus or target because they do have a huge uh, market share in, in all of the um, segments of the industry. However, things are changing and Petrobras right now has a divestment plan in place and the focus of the company is to concentrate on their core business, which is the offshore business, right? But anyway, let's talk about Petrobras. Their current production today in the country 
is the following. They produce approximately 2 million, 200,000 million, uh, sorry, barrels a day of oil. And approximately, uh, I can't see because I can't see my figures. Forgot now, it's 100 and what? Because Arnon is, uh, the, the screen is, is it 138? Uh, I forgot, let me see. Yeah, that's it. Thank 138 you. 138 million. Yeah. Natural gas. Yeah. Per cubic 138 meter. 138 natural gas, yeah. In terms of proven reserves, um, that's now 2019 figures. Petrobras, uh, according to, to that po um, most recent research, or, or uh, a source, sorry, they hold 9 billion, 590 million uh, barrels of equivalent oil in reserves. In terms of reserves, um, there is a balance between the players in Brazil. Um, Petrobras holds approximately 50% of the exploration market. So since the beginning, since the monopoly break and the opening of the market in, in 1998, a lot of oil companies started buying assets via the A&P bidding rounds. So that, there is a balance. Uh, so um, the other oil companies together hold something similar to that, a little less than that. In terms of CAPEX, and that's a very important um, piece of information for, um, especially for suppliers interested in Brazil, for the uh, next five years, Petrobras will be investing approximately $75 billion of which, so that's roughly 50, sorry, $15 billion uh, per year. Um, I believe that as most oil companies in the world, that they will certainly soon revise that uh, figure, that investment, you know, to reflect what's happening in terms of the crisis, of the global uh, oil crisis. But this is something that was released at the end of last year. There should be a review, but still we're talking about, I mean, this is $75 billion in five years, roughly $15 billion per year, of which 85% will be invested in exploration and production projects. Roughly, I mean, mostly offshore. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of our of my presentation, the pre-salt production or the pre-salt play is an important, is a very important um, uh, play, globally speaking. And uh, again, if you compare the pre-salt with uh, other important plays in the world, we are certainly, uh, the pre-salt and Brazil is certainly, I mean, less impacted. And that is due to the fact that it's one very, uh, uh, I mean, productivity rate is very, very high. And they have managed to produce a very, not very short, but uh, in terms of, in comparison with other plays, the break even is approximately $25 uh, dollars per barrel. So that's still doable considering the, actual, the, the present uh, uh, crisis. Just so you know, in the next five years, Petrobras will be putting uh, 13 new offshore production platforms in, uh, into operation. That will be in deep and ultra deep waters in order to produce in the pre salt and also in other offshore uh, place. So imagine 13 uh, offshore platforms, that would, be, that would be something like $10 billion just in investments in platforms. That's a lot, a lot of, of money indeed. Uh, Arnon, uh, please. Thank you. This is more. This slide talks about Petrobras' investment. So this represents opportunities for investors. And then in the next slides, I'm going to be talking about opportunities for suppliers, okay? But for those companies interested in investing in the Brazilian oil and gas sector, the, the huge opportunity that we have in the, in the country right now is the Petrobras invest, investment uh, program. Um, they are selling assets for a number of reasons. The most important one is the severe financial crisis that they, they went through with 
you know, due to a number of reasons, I'm not going to talk about that right now, but they had to sell assets in order to survive. They were going through a very difficult, very difficult financial situation. And um, there was a change in, in man and top management. And they decided to create this, pre uh, this divestment uh, program. So what are they doing? We have the Topazio program, which is basically something that Arnon even mentioned in his talk uh, before me. So um, the focus of Petrobras is the offshore uh, business, of course, but there are some offshore fields, the shallow water uh, fields, mature and not mature, that are not of high importance. So they're selling them. Petrobras is also withdrawing, leaving the onshore segments. They are selling a number of onshore fields in the country. They have started selling and, and they will sell in the future. So there's some of these, uh, by the way, some of these fields, both onshore and offshore, they are being offered under that regime that I mentioned before, the permanent offer. So if you go to the ANP website, you can have all the information about that. So any company in the world that is interested in entering the Brazilian upstream segment can now acquire assets via that uh, permanent offer uh, regime, much easier, much, much easier than, than going through all the qualification process that a bidding round requires. So the Topazio program is basically the sale of onshore and shallow water mature fields. The natural gas transportation um, segment is also um, being open to private investment. Petrobras has sold a number of pipelines, but they are going to sell others. So stay tuned if you're interested in that particular segment. The refining segment, as I had mentioned, uh, brings opportunities for investors. That's for, um, I mean, big people, big companies, because uh, it's very expensive. But anyway, Petrobras is going to sell, is actually selling right now 50% of its refineries in the country. In terms of fuel distribution, they already sold part of their um, distribution company, which is called BR Distribuidora, and they're selling um, biofuel uh, assets, petrochemical assets, all that to concentrate on the offshore uh, segment. Okay, next, please. Obrigada. Thank you. Now, let's talk about some opportunities for Canadian suppliers. Of course, I have to say, when you think about opportunities, if you're a supplier of equipment and services to the oil and gas industry, the very first op uh, window of opportunities is the offshore industry. But for Canadian suppliers or for Canada, where the onshore segment is so important, I have to talk about these opportunities as well. So first, bear in mind, there's a, there, there are many opportunities for suppliers of technology solutions, goods and services to the offshore industry. Basically, the construction, operation, and maintenance of offshore platforms. So FPSOs, FSOs, same subs, drilling rigs, okay? But we also have opportunities, and I have to say, in the onshore segment, for instance, and we, know, we all know that Canada has a huge track record in that. So um, considering the um, onshore mature fields that are being acquired today by a number of junior and medium-sized independent private companies with the Topazio program, project, which I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, I would say that the most important um, solution or something that is of high interest to all of these companies, because they are, again, they are acquiring mature fields, is enhanced oil recovery solutions or technologies. We all know that Canada has a huge track record in that particular area, so this is something that I would definitely suggest or advise companies to stay tuned to. If you're interested in the onshore segment in Brazil and you have um, your solutions to uh, offer 
I think you should uh, consider Brazil because again, these oil companies that are buying these assets, they will need that to move on and start producing their fuels. Well, in terms of natural gas transportation, um, the most important pipelines in the country today, they belong to, one belongs to a Canadian company, the other one has a very strong Canadian content. All that to say that uh, it, it's normally much easier when you're dealing with a Canadian customer abroad. So you should consider that. So in terms of opportunities, we have pipeline operation, pipeline maintenance, and in the near future, I would say there should be new pipelines, greenfield pipelines, or new pipelines being built, because a lot of natural gas is going to be produced in the country in the next decade. So that's also a window of opportunities. Also, we have to talk about LNG, LNG facilities. Um, this is a market that's growing everywhere in the world and that's not different in Brazil. So pay attention to that as well. Um, next, Arnon, I'm not sure about timing. I think I still have three or four more um, uh, slides. Are, are we okay? We're okay, yes. We have a few yeah. questions already and I encourage everyone to please ask questions on the chat so we can answer them. And also Diego will be posting uh, all of this is produced by my business development manager, Diego Correa, and he'll be posting a questionnaire um, so you guys can please fill it out for us and give feedback on the webinar so we can improve it for you. So just before I forget, just to mention that. Uh, now, this is the one, Opportunity in Digital, Nadine? Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. Well, <clears throat> um, I selected two more key areas of opportunities for Canadian suppliers. One, because first, Canada has also has a track record in digital solutions in industry 4.0. The second one is the next slide, is uh, clean technologies for oil and gas. And both digital transformation and clean technologies are top subjects, top or hot topics in the oil and gas industry. Digital transformation, number one, the first one. <clears throat> uh, we all know that the oil companies globally, they are a little late in terms of the digital transformation run. And that's because um, the oil and gas industry requires extensive capital, so everything is very expensive. So basically, I believe that oil companies prefer to wait to see what the other sectors were doing, what would work, what wouldn't, so that they could do their digital transformation, uh, I mean, process. But anyway, um, that this digital transformation is a very important and subject and, and interest in Brazil. Petrobras, again, they created, last year they created a specific and a new, uh, major division just to um, take care of digital transformation. Um, so they don't have a consolidated list of demands in terms of what they are looking for. They don't know what they are looking for actually. Um, they're still learning and discussing and they right now trying to implement a digital transformation culture in the company. But we had access to, um, well, basically we organized the webinar with the head of the digital transformation of Petrobras exactly 40 days ago. He made a presentation via webinar to, uh, to our clients and, um, and he listed, he was asked and he listed those technologies that are the ones of highest interest to the uh, oil and gas industry and to Petrobras. So he said it, they were blockchain, logistics 4.0, digital refinery. And I can't read now, sorry, Arnon, can you read to me? Performance computing, digital twin, Augmented reality, AI-based asset management. Not sh not sh not sure yeah. if I Block skip. Block blockchain logistics 4.0, digital refinery, high-performance computing, digital twin, uh, 
augmented reality and AI based assess asset management. That's right. That's it. Um, something that is um, important, of course. Why? Why do they? Why do they? Why? Why is that so important? Everybody wants and needs to reduce costs and promote efficiency gains. So basically, innovative, disruptive technologies that can prove to make sure they will promote cost reduction and efficiency gains are welcome. Okay, um, we have recently hired a uh, study on digital transformation demands in the Brazilian oil and gas sector. I would be happy to share it with uh, our clients in, in the near future. Um, but basically, what people must have in mind, what companies must have in mind is the following. Despite the fact that Brazil is a developing country, the oil and gas industry in Brazil is very well developed. Petrobras invests huge amounts of money in production and development every year. Their research center is among the most important and renowned in the world. All that to say that they require innovative, cutting edge technologies. Everybody tries to sell to Petrobras in Brazil because it's a huge uh, uh, oil and gas industry. So um, they are interested in innovation. They're interested in cutting edge technologies, okay? No matter if it's for their operations offshore or in their refineries mm -hmm. or um, some of the pipelines that they are keeping or the gas processing plants. But I mean, if it's if it's not something unique or innovative or cutting edge you don't have much chances i have to be honest <laughs> well let's talk about clean technologies and now i will allow myself to just read what's written there this is a summary of the uh, petrobras environmental sustainability ability uh, agenda that was released recently so this is their uh, view on the um, environmental agenda that they want to promote in order for them to cope with the energy transition that is inevitable. And I believe from there, you can extract some very good opportunities in terms of clean technologies. I will read it from my uh, physical copy because I can't read everything. So just give me a second and we will be finished. Just a second. Well, so let's go. So these are opportunities concentrated on carbon footprint reduction and water management. Petrobras environmental sustainability agenda. So these are targets to be met by 2025, not very far. Zero growth in operation emissions, zero routine flaring by 2030, 32 carbon intensity reduction in upstream operations, 30 to 50 percent methane emission reduction in upstream operations, 16 carbon intensity reduction in refining, 30 percent reduction in freshwater use with a focus on increasing reuse, reuse, zero residues, um, sorry, zero residues generation increase, and 100% of Petrobras facilities with a biodiversity plan. Wow. Before I finish, if I could give you supplier, um, piece of, a piece of advice about doing business in Brazil, do consider identifying a local partner. Brazil is a huge market, the oil and gas industry is huge, it is, um, I mean, home to most of the oil majors in the country, sorry, in the world. And uh, so do look for a partner. We can help you identify a partner. Why am I saying that? We have language barriers. Not, not everybody in Brazil speaks the language. Um, these people, the local companies, they know the business, the, the business culture of, you know, of doing business in Brazil. They know 
the contacts, they know Petrobras and the other players. Um, I mean, without a partner, if you're a small, even a medium-sized company, life is much harder, I would say. So we definitely um, advise that people look for a partner. We definitely advise that you come down in person. When it possible. doesn't work. It when doesn't work sending an email. Correct. I mean, just, no, yeah. you have to come down, look people in the eye, shake hands. It's have a Latin coffee. America. It is, it, have a coffee, have, yeah, talk about the weather, complain about the government, and then yeah. you go and start talking about business, right? I mean, this is very important. Um, well, we are here to help yeah. our clients, to help Canadian companies, I think. This is thank basically you. it. Turn on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadine. Yeah, before we go, for, for before questions. we go on, I want to say uh, I, I want to thank all the viewers for being here today. I know there is a lot of um, uh, government uh, agencies uh, watching the presentation, investors, uh, oil companies, and terrific uh, candidates in the oil and gas industry. And I want to thank. Uh, uh, Ledia, who is here, who is a, a terrific candidate. So thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Nadine, for all this, these insights. And you're right, um, if Brazil is a very sophisticated market. If you're going to penetrate in this industry, you need to be prepared to go you know, head in head, right, with big players and bring innovation yeah. to, to the market. Otherwise, you're not gonna succeed. You gotta do your homework. And that's what the Trade Commissioner Office can do, can help you do your homework before you land there and go for a coffee and uh, food by kilo and uh, talk about the dog and the weather and, and then get the deal done, right? <laughs> when we are allowed to get on a plane and go to Brazil again. Um, so this is the information from Nadine uh, from the uh, Trade Commissioner Office. I have some questions already that people uh, put in uh, on the chat. So I'd like to go to them right away because we are running out of time. And uh, the first question is from Stephen Keyes. I'm hoping in saying that. What services and expertise from Canada are uh, sought by the oil and gas supply chain in Brazil? So what expertise do you think you can recommend? Um, Arnon. I know Stephen uh, very well. Actually, we, we have been talking uh, recently. Wonderful. Uh, well, um, there's a lot of, of opportunities, as I said. Um, from Canada, I would say that um, pipeline construction, maintenance, and operation, this is something that um, that Canada is is very good at, and, and uh, I I see a lot of opportunities in Brazil and growing right now. I would say um, enhanced oil recovery services, as I had mentioned. I'm talking about the most um, demanded ones. I would say, okay, there's is a vast window of different services that uh, mm -hmm. that are required. Um, some very unique specific engineering services because I know um, MGA uh, is, a, is an engineering company. Um, well, I guess this is it. It, okay. it, it all depends That's on it. a number of factors, but yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm sure you yeah. can ab elaborate uh, back to, to Steve as well. Uh, on an email because we will be sharing this, that your contact information. Another yeah. question from, so thank you. Another question from Dan Frederick is, in terms of opportunities in Brazil, do you foresee any needs for specialized training, education programs or research in order to build capacity in the oil gas sector? That's a very good question. Yeah, education so what, sure. yeah, what's his name again? Uh, his name is, uh, oh my God, sorry, I, I lost the, uh, Dan Frederick, Dan Frederick. Okay, Dan. Yes, Dan, um, I would say yes, there is space for specific specialized uh, training services in the oil and gas sector, yes, but just so you know, the largest um, training facility in the oil and gas industry in Brazil is what we call again, Petrobras University. 
Petrobras University is a specific entity that belongs to Petrobras, whose purpose is to train all the personnel that joins the company, the young people, the engineers and the top executives, they do recycling. They, I mean, it's a huge entity. They have uh, agreements, partnerships with a number of different universities, research centers, and training schools global wide. Um, mm -hmm. There's also other schools that provide training uh, services for the oil and gas industry, specifically in Brazil. I would not say that there is not space, but it's not easy. It's not something that, uh, I mean, that we don't have here. We do have the, the capacity. We have at least three very important training schools that uh, provide uh, specialized oil and gas training. Petrobras University, Senac, Sim, Senai Simatec, um, and Sebrae, yeah. I don't know. No, so I mean, is there a space? Yes, there is. But right. you have to find something very unique to offer because there's competition. Yeah, no, I can imagine. I have a couple of questions from Ivan. I'm going to read them together so we can sum, sum them up if possible. So any particular problems during drilling and completion uh, where we can offer our technology? So that's the first question, I guess, which, you know, where our technology could be um, used. And then another question from him is, do you have any drilling programs for the next five years? and a list of the junior and mid-sized players. From the end to the beginning, we do have a list of the onshore and offshore players. We do have that. Um, I need to know exactly what the technology for drilling is, okay? I mean, drilling onshore, offshore, especially offshore, there'll be a lot of drilling campaigns in the, in the course of the next decade reflecting all the bidding rounds that were held in the last three years. I mean, last year there were three bidding rounds. So there's a lot of drilling campaigns coming yes. on board, that's for sure, especially offshore, okay? Um, so, uh, I mean, there's opportunities, yes, for sure. Yeah, I think I forgot one of the questions. The second question is, um, I th I, uh, well, the list, um, uh, for the next five years, right, of the junior and mid-sized players. And the other question is the type of technology that Canada could offer to these players. And I think you answered that in one of the questions from the beginning as well, um, related to clean tech and uh, a lot of that. You said there's a, there's a lot of technology already that exists, so you have to be really really focus right on the on the on the technology but i think also just to complement i think your office could definitely i'm sure you have a report that you can send to our viewers that they can analyze and say mm, interesting these are the companies doing doing this kind of drilling and we have this technology that could match what they need right now i'm sure yeah we we do have uh, a report or a few, couple of reports and we can help if there's not very specific info because there's 100, I don't know, 200 important projects in the country. We don't, we don't track all of them to, to I mean, at a, at a very specific level of detail, but we can certainly help them identify the people who will be able to answer that. That's what we do. We match the Correct. dots, okay? We, Matchmaking is huge. Is huge part of the trade commission. Yes. So people sometimes forget that yes. that you have real leads that can lead to a contract. These are not people just flying by. There, you you know who they are in the country, and that's why it's so helpful, right? That's right. Yeah, that's it. Cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I want to read our summary and then we can finish because we, of course, did go over time. But anyway, thank you for everyone who stayed this long. So in summary, the Trade Commissioner services in Brazil are there to help you um, analyze who you are in Canada, your business, your product, and guide you to make connections. As Nadine said, to, to have a partner in Brazil is crucial if you want to penetrate the market. You cannot penetrate the market being here via phone and via an email. Right, Nadine? That's what 
Uh, you guys, all, you got to come down and have that coffee and talk about the dog and the weather. Uh, the oil and gas industry in Brazil has been severely impacted about COVID, of course. Uh, it, the crisis still continues. Brazil offshore reserves are more resilient due to the high productivity and break even on the pre-salt. Most projects are, are moving on. Brazil uh, oil and gas production growth rates on track to become world's second largest by 2030. Uh, the Rystead Energy Report says that. And there are opportunities in several segments of the industry and huge investments by Petrobras and major oil uh, players in the market. And Brazil can be difficult market. Identifying a local partner, as I said, is normally the best approach in the Trade Commissioner Office of the Canadian government in Brazil can help you do that with uh, uh, confidence and security. So there you go. Here's my pitch about the Trade Commissioner Office who does an amazing job and these professionals are there to help you. I wanna thank again my speaker for today, Nadine Lopez. It was a pleasure having you and so much information. I learned so much from you and all your colleagues and I, I can't wait for the next one in two weeks. We have another webinar with the Trade Commissioner Office. So please join us again, watch for our mailing list. Nadine, last words, thank you. Thank you, it was a pleasure and honor for me to be able to speak here and try to help Canadian companies. I'm open to, uh, I mean, to continue talking if any companies want to reach out to me. And thank you again, Arnon and Mellow Hawk for putting this together. This is a very interesting, beautiful project that you guys are uh, implementing. So very good, yeah. thank you. We, 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 we value so much what you guys do in Brazil and I, we wanted our clients in Canada and new potential clients to understand the help they can get from you guys in Brazil. So it's very, very crucial to help promote. Uh, we are just a mid-sized company, but we do a lot in Brazil, and, and you are such a support to these companies going there. So thank you to you and your team. So I'm going to say goodbye, and thank you. It was a pleasure being here, and thank you for all of you who joined us tonight. today. You're going to get a copy of this presentation. Please fill out our survey. We're going to leave the link on. It's very important to us. I want to thank you, Diego Correa, my business development manager that I forget to thank on every presentation because he puts it all together. There is so much work that goes in preparing this together with our speakers. So it's all credit goes to Diego. So thank you so much, Diego. And uh, thank you everyone for watching and I'll see you on another webinar. Bye Nadine. Bye. Be you. safe and be safe everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye.